Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to the Truth. It's a blessing and privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as we enter another new week that wasn't promised to that this message finds you blessed. It finds you walking in the gifts God has given you. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm excited because we're going to enter into another new little mini-series. And um, it's an interesting piece. Uh, That little voice has been wearing me out, so I finally surrendered and uh, started to go back and look at the scriptures that it was talking about. And and it's a wonderful passage of scriptures coming out of 1 Peter chapter 3. It's going to be verses 8 through 12. But here is the focal point of it. There's, I didn't realize that. Well, there's always so many different ways scripture can teach you from life. The same scriptures. So he's given me a new perspective. Now, here's my thing. The common thing, even uh, this past week of walking and talking with people, hanging out and doing various things, att- attending some retirement ce- celebrations and so forth, everyone is discussing living their best life. Amen. 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 You know, when I get to this point, I'm going to live this best life, you know, right? And so we have this vision in our mind or, or we articulate and we plan to do it this way and that way, right? Do you realize that in your process of doing so, of creating this best life for yourself, it is based off the choices you make? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now, I, I'm just I'm just went through as God was working on me. He had me go back and look at some of the, 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 the biblical heroes and heroines in the Bible. Right. And look at some of the choices they made. So if you think about it, Cain and Abel. Mm-hmm. Cain made a choice to kill his brother. Not to change himself, but to kill his brother so his offering would be considered better. Choice, right? How about Esau and Jacob? Mm -hmm. Esau trades off his birthright for a bowl of stew. Mm -hmm. I hope it was excellent stew. (laughs) But he was willing to trade because we want what we want right then. And we don't care what we have to give up long term to get what I want right now. So he trades off his birthright for a bowl of stew. And then his brother Jacob, by choice and his mother's help, chooses to deceive his father so he would get the birthright, the first child blessing. So it's the choices we make determines the life we build. Amen. Amen. And so how about this? How about King David looking at his little palace window and seeing uh, but she Bathsheba up there bathing and making the choice to have her come to his chambers. The choices we make. How about this? How about Samson, who was told he was going to be sent there to del- release, deliver, start to deliver his people from the Philistines. And he goes out and requires a Philistine woman. The choices he made. And it's the very thing that leads to his detriment. It's the choices we make. How about Rahab? Rahab was the prostitute in uh, Jericho. And when she saw the spies coming in and so forth and so on, and she's the one who helps them and hides them. Mm -hmm. And she asked them to cut a deal with me that if I hide you, that when you take over this, you save me and my family. Mm -hmm. Choices we make because she's captured in the lineage of Jesus. And she was a prostitute. Her life changed based off of her choices. She got the better life in this deal. Come on now. So so here's what I want you to get as we enter into this beautiful new little series. That our choices we make will either allow us to walk in the blessings of God or in the corrections of God. One gives you the ultimate blessing. Mm -hmm. One gives you the ultimate chastisement. Some of us weave back and forth between the lines. So you never get the full blessing that he has in store for you because you want to do you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Now, Peter this morning is going to write a very, he's writing a very powerful message to the church. The church is going through. Church is under persecution. The persecution is getting worse, not getting less. He says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. He's telling them how to have a good life, even under persecution. He says this. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Verse 10. 
For the ones who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must speak peace and pursue it. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are toward those or toward the righteous, excuse me, and his ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity to stand and be used your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hour has come where your people have got themselves together. Once again, the hero of uh, here from on high. So, Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power to fill me afresh and new with your Holy Spirit, and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide toward the truth before them. And Father God, we will be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. It's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name, we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, Amen? Amen. And Amen. This morning's sermon title is called Built by Your Choices. Built by Your Choices. At the top of your outline, you will find the words, The Good Life. This is the good life is what you have when Christ lives in you and you choose to live for Christ. In this life, God fulfills his promise to give us life and life more abundantly. It is not a perfect life or a pain free life, but it is the life that allows you to receive all that God has in store for you. Somebody should say something. So as always, I just want to welcome you once again this morning. I hope you're settling in. You got your seatbelt on. You're buckled up because we're going to jump into this deal. This is what you hear, right? What Peter just wrote here. These are not suggestions. These are commands. These are, he's telling you, these are the choices you must make. Not optional. If you want this good life, this best life, this is what you do. And he's telling them to do this in horrible circumstances. So he's not saying wait till things get better and then do this. He's saying you do this now because better is in you. Come on now. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. You see, as a child of God, we are tremendously blessed. Amen. Amen. And so I don't know if you acknowledge or whether you do or not, it's still true. We are tremendously blessed and we serve a God that cares for us, has compassion for us and desires that we know he cares for us. Amen. No other out there. None. I want you to know that I care for you. Mm-hmm. You know, and so this morning as we open God's word, we find that God has used Peter once again to enrich our Christian walk with another powerful life lesson. Mm -hmm. He uses Peter to tell us how to see good days, how to have the good life. Mm -hmm. And so what I love about this is that God is teaching this lesson to the church, which is scattered abroad in five different regions, and they're going through severe persecution, and it's getting worse, not better. And Peter is sharing this lesson right on the heels of teaching the church that we have to live a godly life in three major social areas of life. He says, this is previous scriptures before, chapter two type stuff. He says, society at large, we are to be godly citizens. Mm -hmm. He says, in the workplace, we are to be godly workers. And in the home, we are to be godly examples before our spouses and family. And so now Peter sums up this teaching with the keys to seeing good days. And when you think of seeing good days or the good life, right? I'm not sure what images pop into your head. But I can tell you what the world is putting there. The world is telling you, you got to have all this money. You got to have the big houses. You got to have the nice cars. You got to be going on vacations everywhere. You got to be wearing the finest haberdashery that they can possibly make, right? You got to be eating gourmet food. You got to have the best seats at sporting and entertainment events. You've got to have health and fitness and you got to have lots of sex. You got to have frequent alcohol consumptions and you got to have that what they call that so-called recreational drug use. (laughs) This is what the world is selling you as the good life. Right. And so these are some of the major images that the world sells as the good days or good life. And the funny thing is this majority of the world buys into these images. We go broke chasing this. Right. And these are the things that define our pursuit in life. Somebody should say something. And through all of those vices I just listed and more, the sad reality, however, is that these, these such things 
are merely a temporary rush. Mm -hmm. It never satisfies. You got to go add something else. You got to go to another new place. You got to add another new woman. You got to add another new man. You got to keep adding all these things because, see, it's a temporary rush. It never satisfies. It never fulfills what is considered the thing that's missing in your life to make it good. And so here's the blessing. Even in the pages of scripture contains examples of men and women who pursued the good life in all the wrong places. One of my favorite to use is King Solomon. He asked God for wisdom. And you think if you got wisdom, you're not going to make bad choices. Wrong. Here's the thing. King Solomon had incredible wealth in the form of land, palaces, chariots, horses, gold and silver, and many beautiful women. He built everything his heart desired. And because he was king over Israel, he also had great power and influence. This man lacked nothing. He had everything that, consist that constituted the good life, right? In fact, in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 3 through 4, it says that when Queen Queen of Sheba visited Solomon and, and observed his immense wealth and power and imposing presence. She was breathless. <laughs> but toward the end of King Solomon's life, Solomon was not content and failed to experience life to the fullest. He captures it. He pins it. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 17, he wrote these words. So I hated life. For the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me because everything is futility in striving after the wind. And so Solomon came to realize that the good life is not found in great accomplishments or in much education. Neither did he find it in pleasure or material possessions. And he finally rendered this sobering conclusion. It's a hard sobering conclusion, but that life was really more oppressive than good. Listen to what he writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He says, Then I looked again at all, of the, at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed in that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power. But they had no one to comfort them. Verse 2, So I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living. Verse three, but better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. Does that sound like a man who has everything? It's like he has nothing if you're reading this, right? That he's in despair. He's, he's, he's just giving up in this deal. Like, I just should have just quit. I should just quit here, right? Solomon, after pursuing the good life according to his own choices. See, he asked for wisdom from God and God gave it to him. But here's the thing. If you choose to lean onto your own understanding, wisdom does you no good. Woo. He saw the things he pursued as oppressive. He went as far as to congratulate the dead and those who were never born. That's from a man who literally had everything his heart could desire. But listen to his words after his pursuit of all this stuff. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. He says this. But remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Let me break that down for you. He's telling us to remember God. Spend our days when we are strong, pursuing him and his will for our lives. Somebody said, now he's at the end of his and he's looking back and said, if I had to do it all over again. This is the choice I'm going to make. Now, he didn't. He had everything. That's the part I need for everybody to get, because we're chasing everything and we will not have the good life if you acquire it, especially if it's not in God's will. Mm -hmm. Ooh, here it is. Here it is. It's tight, but it's right. As Christians, we should love the life God has granted us and enjoy the goodness day 
by day to just say, Lord, thank you for letting me be here one more day and to love on everything that he's entrusted to your care. I mean, not love of it, but love it. But you see, but many of us do not enjoy the God, the life that God has given us. You see, Peter recognized that believers are not exempt from serious and wide ranging difficulties that steal our joy. As believers in Christ Jesus, persecution and suffering are an integral part of our living in an ungodly world. Amen. Amen. It's just many of us don't suffer for that. Huh? We don't suffer for that. We suffer for our ism. For our choices. I'm just trying to tell you this. We're talking about your, your life is built by your choices. So when you suffer, oftentimes you're suffering for a choice you made, not in God, but in you. But still, in spite of the suffering, see, when you suffer for God, there's power in it. But most of us will never experience that because we don't know how to suffer that way. Peter in this passage addresses the believer as the one who desires life to love and to see good days. That's verse 10. And he instructs us on how to realize that desire. And Peter gives us four basic commands for living the good life as God's people, even in the midst of trouble. In verse eight, he tells us to have the right attitude. Do you know your attitude is a choice? Huh? Huh? Then he says in verse nine, have the right response. How you respond to the situations in the world, do you know that's a choice? Then in verses 10 and 11, he tells us to have the right standard by which you live your life. So the standard by which you choose, this is the word, choose to live your life is a choice. And then in verse 12, he says, have the right incentive. Once again, the incentive that drives you is a choice. (laughs) So let's look at this. In verse 8a, Peter concludes his teaching on godly living, starting with the phrase, to sum up. And when Peter says, to sum up, y'all, which actually could be translated as the single word is finally, right? It does not signal the end of the letter, but the conclusion of the current thought. He's summing up his specific references to being godly citizens. That's chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. Godly workers, that's chapter 2, verses 18 to 20. And godly relationships between unsafe spouses, that's chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. He's summing that up. But also what he's doing, he's giving all believers a general exhortation, which will open us up to the life of blessings God desires for us to each enjoy. Do you know God desires for us to be blessed? He wants to see you blessed. He wants to see you flourish. He wants to see you to be the best version of you because you become even greater use for him in the kingdom. He wants that. That's his whole. He has nothing intended negative for you or for me. Do y'all get that? He has never had anything intended negatively for you. Amen. He only wants the best for us. And he only gives the best for us, it's us and our choices as to whether or not we get it. Mm. I used to teach a long time ago, if every prayer that you ever prayed, if you could see it hanging up in the air, coming down, and the only thing that separated you between it was you and your altitude, your attitude would change. Mm-hmm. Hey, come on. See, see so you get it? If you can see all your blessings hanging up in the air that you prayed for, all the things you asked God for, and God is saying, I'm giving it, but you, you've got to change in your attitude so your altitude can come up where you can receive it. So you got to grow. Hoo-wee. Ooh, that's some stuff there, ain't it? You know, and I love this because this is what makes this so powerful. It's in verse 8b that he, it, he tells it, it all begins with having the right attitude. Listen to what he says. All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. So Peter tells us that everything begins with the right attitude. Somebody needs to say something. Everything. It's a choice. Everything begins with the right attitude. So if you got the right attitude when you go into work, if you got the right attitude when you go in there to do them taxes, Everything begins with the right attitude. This is what he's teaching. It begins there. Too often, we, we create the outcome by our attitude before we get to the income. Ooh-wee. 
Y'all missing this. Y'all looking at me like I'm a new fence this morning. It's okay. I'm going to preach it anyhow. Peter tells us that everything begins with the right attitude. And then he lists five spiritual virtues that constitutes this God honoring perspective, starting with believers are to be harmonious. He says, and it literally means to think the same, by the way. Believers are to live in harmony together, maintaining a common commitment to the truth. And it's a harmony in the word. It's a harmony in the word because that's the truth. We're going to have our opinions, but when it comes to the word, there shouldn't be a differing of opinion of the word. Amen. 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 And so that produces an inward unity of the heart with one another. See, if we both agree on the word and what God is teaching us from the word, then we're going to handle one another and, and everyone around us the same way. We're not going to pick and choose who we're going to be a blessing to and who we're going to be a curse. And so Paul shares in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, these words. He says, so in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. So you don't walk around cutting your thumb off because you're mad at the fingers. Right. And when you stomp the pinky toe, even though you might want to cut it off, but you keep it because you don't want to lose your balance. Just trying to teach because he's, he, it's just really simple when he, he uses very beautiful visual language that we should get. And so it's in Romans chapter 12, verse 16, he says this, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. These are choices. These are commands, but these are the choices we have to make to live by. OK, he's telling us how to have all the blessing how to achieve and acquire all the blessing. He wants to shower it down. He said, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. And that's a plural statement. And then he said, I'm going to pour you out a blessing. That's singular. But that blessing is going to be all inclusive. It's going to have everything in it that you need for life. Amen. And the only reason why you don't receive all of it is you. The choices you make. Wow. Do you realize your life is built by your choices? My Lord, my Lord, you see, we must not be in conflict with each other, even under persecution, severe persecution. Paul writes to the Philippians these words in Philippians chapter one, verse 27 to 28. He says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or you remain or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in, in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And that too is from the Lord. He's saying, this is how you live. These are the choices you make. Not options, not suggestions. These are the choices you make if you want to have that best life. The spiritual reality should be the this spiritual reality should be the basis for the church's visible harmony. You see, we have so many different churches because we can't agree on the word. (laughs) True. And so here's the thing. The early church in Acts chapter 2 was a model of visible oneness. They helped, served, and took care of everything. They ministered to one another. They met each other's needs. And they didn't tell the left hand what the right hand was doing. And everybody saw what they had and helped. And and they just kept going forward. And they went from house to house holding church. Everybody was blessed. Didn't mean everybody didn't have issues. But we were blessed together because if I knew you had an issue, I didn't tell a thousand folks you had an issue unless I needed their help to help come alongside you and solve your issue. And then once we helped, we didn't go, well, you know, we had to help them. We didn't do that. (sighs) Mm. You see, secondly, Peter shares believers are to be sympathetic. Peter is saying If we want to experience the fullness of Christian life, we must be sympathetic, which means sharing the same feelings. Y'all get that? Christians are to be united on the truth, 
but also ready to sympathize with the pain of others, even of those we do not know. But the writer of Hebrews writes these words in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. He says, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them. Did y'all get that? It says, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them. And those who are ill-treated since you yourselves also are in the body. So it says, if they hurt, you hurt. You get it? You don't get to revel in somebody else's misfortune. But we're very good at that. We'll make a meme in a moment and put it out there on social media so everybody can see it. Or have it over coffee and talk about it. See, but look at this. This is being just like Christ, our sympathetic high priest. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says he is able to sympathize with us, right? We must share in the feelings of others and in their sorrows as well as their joy. See, I'm talking about your life is built by your choices. Paul shares in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, these words, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who what? Weep. I've had some of the best prayer life time in my life praying for folks that's been going through some stuff who've lost loved ones. I wake up with them on my mind and I'm automatically writing something to them as I'm also praying. Because I know they're hurting. I'm hurting because they lost a loved one, but that loved one was in their home. And if I'm hurting, can you imagine the hurt that they're going through? We must be, we must not be insensitive, indifferent, and disapproving, even toward the lost in their pain of struggling with the issues of life. I see so many different things in life. My bride will tell you, we were, I think we were down in Southern California someplace and um, having a great time, we went there for a great time, and I saw a young lady that was beating her head against the wall. Blood's coming. She's pow, pow. And I, we crossed the street and then I stopped and I started praying because, see, I believe a demon's in her. But I don't want to see anyone suffer. I don't know what her life choices were that led her to be there, that opened herself up for that situation to come into her life. But my heart went out to her because I wanted to help. And I've often said to my bride, she, was, she can confirm this, I said, Lord, just give me the ability to touch someone and heal them. I don't want any money for it. I just want to be able to, because I don't want to see you suffer. And then he says this, if I gave you that, then they would not get the lessons they lead. They've got to grow through. Because I've asked for it. Lord, I just don't want to, I don't want to see someone struggling. Lord, let me have the touch. And I just, they don't even have to see my faces. Let me walk by and keep moving and change their circumstances. And here's the voice that he gives back. And if you do that, then they will not grow. They will not get the message and the lesson they need. Their faith won't be strengthened. Their situation, it's just so many things that he was saying. And I'm like, okay, God. But I still desire not to see people suffer. But that ain't always been my heart. Let's tell the truth. Shame the devil. They ain't always been my heart. I always cared about me and mine. Sucks to be you. But when God is in your heart and your life, that heart's thrown away. So now I've got compassion. Now I've got mercy. Now I've got empathy and sympathy. Even though I don't understand. I feel it. I'll well up with tears and it's you going through it. You see what I'm saying? So here's the thing. Jesus says these words in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw the people. These are sinful people. And he had compassion on them. Y'all getting this? He says because they were distressed. They were going through. And dispirited, they had no hope. Like sheep 
without a shepherd. So if our Savior can have that type of heart and we are to be imitators of him, then that has to be our heart as well. Remember, your life is built by the choices you make. This is one of those choices. And so the unsaved world, here's the other piece. The unsaved world does not know what we know. Somebody should say something. And saints, we must come alongside with empathy to declare God's saving truth to them. Many of you know the story of um, Philip in the Ethiopian. Philip runs up beside the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian is reading the scripture, but he ain't figuring it out. Ain't getting it. Philip risked everything to go into his entourage, to come up beside the, the, the chariot, and to say, do you understand what you are reading? And he says, no, how can I unless someone explains it to me? He risked it all to write on a life. And when he got up there and he started to share, here's what happened. The man became saved. They stopped the chariot, finds the first patch of water. He's baptized and he gets back in his chariot and Philip is whisked away. Y'all get this, right? Isn't that beautiful? So we must come alongside them with empathy to declare God's saving truth and reveal God's truth. This is the piece. When we reveal what God, just if you just recount your own testimony. See, folks want to think they got to be able to preach the whole Bible. You don't have to be able to preach the whole Bible. If, you, if all you can get out is what God did for you, come on now. That's more than the unsaved world has. Thirdly, Peter used the term Philadelphi, translated here as brotherly. The first part of the word stems from the verb philia, which means to love, and refers to affection among people who are closely related in some way. Those who demonstrate that affection will do so by unselfish service for one another. Amen. Come on. Un Y'all notice that part, unselfish service to one another? Unselfish service don't keep a record. Right. We don't keep little ticks in the book. I fed them five times this week. <laughs> you know. Luke shares this in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. It says, in everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Mm. Amen. Paul shares these words in Romans chapter 12, verse uh, 15, verse 2. He says, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. He's saying, look out for your neighbor's needs. Not just your own. You see, that's that's life change. This is a choice, but it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. But because you know the commandment, you have a choice to either live to it or not. If you live to it, you get the blessing. If you don't live to it, you get the correction. And so you wonder sometimes why you struggle. Hmm. Here it is. Blessing, correction. Mm -hmm. Or I can make it really plain for you. Blessing, curse. Mm -hmm. We like correction better. Right. Both are true. Mm -hmm. Whole point is God's trying to get you back to where you're supposed to be in him. And so I love it, because here's the thing. Such service begins in the church among believers, and it extends out to the world. If we can't serve and walk with one another this way, you can't give the outside world something you don't have. You ever heard the old saying, you, you, how you practice is how you play? So if this is practice inside the house of God, and we don't practice well in the house of God, then you're never going to play well outside of it. Ooh, that's some hot stuff, isn't it? I'm so glad y'all don't have no rocks today because y'all have been to stone me by now. But fourthly, Peter tells us that we are to be kind-hearted. This is a beautiful one. The Greek word that is translated is uh, kind-hearted is a beautiful word that describes the depth in which we are to feel the needs of others. It refers to one's internal organs, by the way. 
It's often and sometimes translated as bowels or intestines. You ever say, I feel it in my stomach? Feel it in my gut. Yes. Right? This word signifies a powerful kind of feeling, much like sympathetic, by the way. The expression calls for being so affected by the pain of others as to feel it deeply. Following the kind of tender hearted compassion that God through his son has for sinners. Remember, Jesus looked at all those folks, said he had compassion on them. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter four, verse 32, these words, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Commandment. But a choice you have to make, not a suggestion. And then fifthly, Peter shares that we are to be humble. This is probably my favorite. Peter shares that we are to be humble in spirit. Humble in spirit is actually one word in the Greek, by the way, and it means humble minded. Okay. Humility is arguably the most essential, all encompassing virtue of Christian life. Um, your life is built by your choices. Do you know humility makes you approachable? Mm -hmm. Humility makes people amenable to you. Humility, even though you may be great -er at something than someone else, but you do not flaunt it to make them feel bad. You may have a greater knowledge of the Bible. You may have a greater relationship with your spouse. You may have greater children and so forth and so on, but you're not flaunting it. You're not using it as a weapon. Y'all looking at me. That is a hard lesson to learn. But when you get it, it changes everything. Everything. And why I say everything, wherever you go, they get a humbled version of you. But you are so blessed by God that when they start to talk to you and a little bit of the aroma of your life rubs off on them, they become blessed. Huh? It's a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. It's a situation that you mo you're the most humble person. All of a sudden you walk into the room and the entire room changed just because your presence came in. Because you are whole and complete. Mm -hmm. Not needing to add anything or anyone to you to make you feel like you belong to be there. But what you will find others wanting to be in your presence. Mm -hmm. Because there's a peace. Mm -hmm. There's a calmness. There's a, a, an attraction because when you speak, they hang on your word. Not because of you, but because of whose you are. Mm -hmm. The choice if you made has shaped you into this. Whoo, I'm telling you, your life is built by your choices. And so let's get ready to get out of this, okay? Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5b, these words. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility. Listen to this. Words matter. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the what? Humble. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, these words. He says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. You see, the joys of Christian life in Christ is maximized when we are united in truth and in life with one another. Somebody should say something. When we are peaceful, peaceful in disposition with everyone and when we are gracious toward those who need the gospel and when we are sensitive to the pains of sinners. When we are sacrificial in loving service to all, to all. We're very good at being loving and sacrificial in service to those we like. When we are compassionate instead of harsh. And above all, when we are humble like our Savior. You see, it was Jesus who said these words in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. He said this, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burdens is light. You see, if you want to see good days, it begins with the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And as we learned this morning, we must have the right attitude as well. That's the choice you got to make. And if it's the Lord's will, we will cover the remaining three points over the next two weeks. But here's the thing I want you to put in your pipe and smoke on this. Living as the church, it doesn't cause you to go into debt. But it makes you one of the richest people walking on the face of the earth. Because you have found true satisfaction in Jesus Christ and you have the right attitude toward others. And it is seen in the choices you make because your life is built by the choices you make. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poll weak and unworthy servant. Father, I thank you for the opportunity and the ability to stand and be able to be useful in your service today. God, I pray, Father, that was all that was shared this morning was acceptable in thy sight, God. God, I just thank you and I love you and I appreciate all that you do. God, I want to continue to lift up the Grimes family to you right now as they continue to carve out this next chapter of life, missing the husband, missing the father. And God, did I ask, Lord, that you would help us be the, be you, and come alongside as this family starts to make this, this journey forward in this next chapter. Allow us to touch them where they need to be touched. Allow us to encourage them where they need to be encouraged. And allow us to supply the needs that we can supply as they have needs. And God, we just want to praise you and thank you. And we ask you now, Father, even before we get ready to leave this place, but never your sight, God, go before us. Lead us and guide us. Keep us in perfect peace until we shall come together again. And Father, we'll be forever careful. To always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Like and share. Drop me a comment. Love you. See you next week. Take care.